Hi, 3DMJers. This is Andrea Valdez, and you are listening to the 3D Muscle Journey Podcast. Before we dive into today's episode, just wanted to remind everyone to head over to 3DMuscleJourney.com and sign up for our Big 3 newsletter. We call it this because in case you haven't noticed, our team comes up with three new pieces of content every week in the form of two articles in one podcast episode. Rather than remembering to check back with us three times a week, we can send it all to you in one single email every Thursday. This weekly digest also includes direct links to any other content that Team 3DMJ coaches are a part of throughout the entirety of the internet. Whether that's guest appearances, interviews, seminars, or courses, you will not miss any of it. So if you like hearing about all the free resources that we have to offer, all the products we sell, all the projects we are a part of, and all the ways you can get discounts, reminders, and early access to them, head over to 3dmusclejourney.com right now and sign up. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the show. Today, I'm joined by Brad Loomis and Eric Helms as we talk about tracking your training progress. We go over quite a few approaches in this episode because we notice that there are a whole lot of people out there who don't know that there are quite a few approaches to this whole tracking thing. So starting with power lifters and finishing with bodybuilders, we discuss the methods, purposes, and reasoning behind different testing protocols and how they might apply to various types of athletes at different skill levels. You'll hear us discuss 1RM testing, AMRAP testing, mesocycle volume tracking, single set volume tracking, physique progress photos, and everything in between. Most importantly, you'll hear us talk about when and why we select particular methods for particular athletes, and why there are some seemingly common approaches that we actually prefer not to use at all. So let's get into it, guys. As always, if you have any feedback or comments on this specific episode, you can leave them for us at 3dmusclejourney.com under podcast number 46. Here it is, tracking your training progress with Eric Helms and Brad Loomis. So in my brain, which I know we fought about this last time, Eric, but tell me if this makes sense before we fight about it, okay? <laughs> I figure we could go powerlifter to bodybuilder because that is more objective versus subjective and there's like one clear way versus like other clear ways. Not clear, I shouldn't say that. There's a, a more objective way. I think it's a better way to start it. Um, so start... I'm fine with that. Just don't in the middle of me explaining my powerlifters be like, but what about bodybuilders? <laughs> what the fuck? We just decided. <laughs> Hold on, and just to be clear, we, we didn't like, decide. Right, look, gonna... We did. You decided. I decided. Time. Yeah, we I'm did. a decider. <laughs> <laughs> we. I said this, so we all definitely agreed. Is what I just heard. I'm the decider. <laughs> I decide. You're so intimidating with that banana. For if you're listening to this on the podcast, he literally has a banana. If you're not watching on YouTube, and he's threatening us with it. He's waving yeah. it at us and I'm putting it in our face. Mm. <laughs> oh my god. The fruit. Should I, should I, the fruit. Should I peel the banana? Oh my god. <laughs> so it's a, so it's a little more. Or I'll make it as long more. As, you, uh, as long as you're tracking thousand, your progress I'm slowly. A little more American. This is European. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> and, and certain religions. And no. <laughs> no, it's Jewish. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. So about, about training, um, okay, Brad, talk to us about tracking progress for a powerlifter. That was really vague, but let's go from the most obvious. We want to do well in a meet, right? And how do we do that? Um, you know, I think probably I'll, I'll start with me. I'm, I'm a powerlifter, okay. right? Yeah. And we'll talk about how I track my progress. And it's perfect because there's my coach right there eating his banana. <laughs> and uh, he can he can also, you know, either attest to or, or add to, um, you know, a lot of times for me is if I'm going through a training block from from training session to training tra- session and week to week, I can't even really tell if I'm progressing. It doesn't right. really feel like it. All the loads are are suboptimal. Um, some training sub-max, sessions sub-max, are sub-max. tough for the sub-max. I'm sorry. Submaximal, yes. <laughs> good thing he's here. It's a good thing he's here. There's submaximal. He's absolutely right. Um, and and, and some, some sessions are hard. Some are easy. You know, but it, it's just all training to me. It's just getting in there and knocking the workout. However, you know, 
every fourth week or eighth week or whatever you know the the frequency is um we have a, a way of tracking progress and really that works best for me because we need to we need to do that in in a a frequent enough basis that it gives me incentive to get my training done and stick to what Eric um, has planned for me. Um, and then also, I can't progress week to week to week to week. And I still need to be able to to see it. So, you know, whether that is, you know, I, I, I've gone over in some of our, our other YouTube videos, kind of our recipe for success. But whether it's a one rep max or it's an AMRAP at whatever load that, that Eric has got uh, prescribed for me, my progress is really only measured like every fourth to eighth week. And even then, it's not necessarily the same. So you have to compare apples to apples. So I might do two AMRAP weeks that are about eight weeks apart, be able to compare those two to track progress. And then we track 1RM attempts, which might be six months apart. So. The tracking, the way that we have it set up, for me, is is infrequent and, and under circumstances where we have to kind of compare um, like to like, apples to apples. And then everything that happens in between there, it's almost immeasurable from month to month to month. It really has to be measurable from year to year to year to year. Where was I reps-wise, intensity-wise, tonnage-wise last year as compared to this year? And that's why you can't see it from week to week to week to week. So I hope that makes sense, but Eric can probably expand on that just a little bit more. I, I can. I can expand. Um, yeah, this is actually a Just a like a cool, banana. Just like, I oh, know bananas stay the same size. What are you talking about? That's disgusting. Oh, my God. That could, so inappropriate, Andrea. Oh, my God. Um, to, just to throw our me listeners, under the I bus. I just want to apologize for <laughs> our, our breach of, of professionalism that, that happened there because of Andrea and no one else. But um, Ever. anyway. Never. I'll, I'll anyone get back, else. I'll get back to the important things. Go ahead. Um, please. <laughs> save us, will you? Yes. I, I'm always here to save you. Um, so I think this is a really cool topic because it's really multifaceted. Um, so Brad touched on a few of the reasons why testing might look very different between athletes. One that he touched on would be uh, training age. Um, at a certain training age or with a new movement, which is essentially you have a low training age on that movement, your training does measure your progress. You can literally see that you can do more weight and more reps at the same or sometimes even a lower RPE when you're, when you're early on in your training career. I'm having a little honeymoon phase right now with hip thrusts um, because I haven't done them in so long and I can't squat because of my hip surgery. So now I'm doing hip thrusts and every week I'm basically just increasing uh, 10 kilos or like 20 something pounds uh, and doing the same reps at the same RPE. And then once I start to top off, I'd slow down the progression rate. So testing is really not needed for early stage intermediates and, and beginners in my opinion. Uh, if your training loads are going up and your RPE, which is something I think you should track even if you're not using RPE to program, just so you can have a record of how difficult it was, um, then you can just train and see that you're getting stronger. However, once you get to the point where you're a higher level competitive athlete, it does become very useful to have some type of metric of tracking progress. Uh, and then different things will differentiate between the way you'll want to track progress. And one of them is uh, your training strategy. So for example, like Brad alluded to with him, he trains uh, with submaximal loads that on almost every single day, he should be able to complete all his volume without missing anything. And it's rare uh, that we would need to you know, reduce the load or he'd come back to me and go, hey coach, I, I couldn't get that three by eight. I went eight, seven, six. Um, and for most people, that is how I like to program. Um, if I can have them progress without pushing near to failure, fantastic. I think that makes the risk of injury lower and it makes the stress per unit of volume lower and it allows us to accumulate very high quality um, skill you know, patterning basically. However, some people have a big disconnect between their submaximal performance and their max performance. Andrew, this is something you've talked about where if, you don't, if you're not doing maxes semi-regularly, they were very intimidating and, and the form feels very different. Um, so someone like Brad, his form is extremely stable, he's a very skilled lifter. Um, he's not a very explosive lifter, so his form looks the same whether he's 
hitting a single at 70% or even 100% to some degree. It's just a different bar speed. Uh, and I know he has very good transfer from sub-maximal to maximal. I've got other lifters uh, where sometimes I find even far away from a competition in the middle of what you might categorize as a volume block, um, I might have them hit a single at 8 RPE and then do back offsets to get their volume in just to kind of keep that high-end top gear. Um, and then in some ways, that single at 8 RPE, if that's going up, that, that can be a, a gauge of progress um, in and of itself. Um, however, if you're not doing that, then yeah, the AMRAPs are a very useful tool um, and doing um, you know as many reps as possible. But probably it's a good idea to cap that or do it to like a 9 RPE. That's what I commonly do because your goal is to measure progress, not to necessarily create a bunch of fatigue from that test that then interferes with the next block of training. So that's, I guess that's, that's probably a lot of information. I'll leave it there as I'm sure you'll want to touch certain things or clarify or we'll build off of that. Yeah, I super want to go backwards because all of that was really useful, but I was looking for it at the, at the very beginning to be like, so power lifters need their 1RM to go up over time. That was probably the sentence one that I should have started instead of half leading it on and then leaving it. Uh, but so... Powerlifters. Wait, wait, I'm sorry. Powerlifters need their one RM to go up over. Okay, it's I true. Write this down. It's true. It's <laughs> true. But I'm saying how that differs from um, completely, not completely, but in a big way for a physique athlete, which we'll get to eventually. But with, with the fact that um, Brad mentioned two testing types, and so did you. There's there's a one rep max, which he says he does use for a measure of progress sometimes. And then there's the AMRAP, which is obviously, hopefully, I'll know as many reps as possible. Um, and why would you give him two different types sometimes, Eric? Good question. Um, because training, specificity really is the answer to that. So the type of training you're, you're doing is going to primarily transfer to the same thing. Meaning that if you're doing a lot of 8s and 10s and 12s, you're going to be good at doing 8s and 10s and 12s. That's mind-blowing. But um, <laughs> likewise, if you're doing heavy low reps, you're going to be good at doing heavy low reps. And um, your ability to perform high reps or ability to perform low reps to failure, either a 1RM or say a 15RM, is going to be directly influenced by the training you've just done. Um, so it can be disheartening to do a 1RM with someone who's just done a bunch of 10s and 15s and 20s if, not, not that I would do that with a powerlifter. Let's say I'll use a better powerlifting example. Eights and sixes and fours and fives. If they're doing a bunch of you know, rep, uh, rep targets in that range, and they're getting better and better at that in their training. So, and then let's say it's, it's you know, January, and their last meet was in November, and we're just kind of coming off of a recovery block and just starting up our volume for the, for the annual training uh, season. To then have them go, right, after this next eight-week block, let's do a new 1RM there's a high probability that even though they're getting stronger at those high reps, they would have a lower 1RM than their last competition and feel like, fuck, I've, I've backslid from last okay. season and I'm already starting this, this season in a deficit. And that's not really accurate. It's just that, A, we need you to recover from what typically is like, you know, joint pain, stress, and aches and pains from having, you know, at the end of a powerlifting season, every unit of volume is at a higher intensity relative to earlier. So we need some, you know, soft tissue and joint recovery. Uh, and mental recovery, because I don't know about you, but for most people, all of their training being super heavy and especially at hinging upon competition can be pretty mentally stressful. And every time you're getting under the bar, you know that if you don't get your setup right, you could miss groove and actually miss a rep is a lot more stressful than getting under to do 10s or 12s or 8s or 6s. So I think it's very important to step away from the heavy lifting for a little bit after powerlifting season's over, but then you can't expect to test on that. So I think doing something like taking 85% of their 1RM and doing as many reps as possible to a 9 RPE, so leaving one in the tank, is a great way to test progress without inducing unnecessary mental or physical stress, as an example. Right. And I think um, what we always, when we're talking about Brad, I think you already said it, but we need to keep in mind, too, that he is a high-level powerlifter who's been lifting for a long time. And I don't um, – I guess if you're in the first – one to maybe three, four, five years, you don't necessarily have to test both back and forth depending on your program and all that stuff, right? So um, I guess the, the take-home point there is that he, he's at a place where he needs um, a very purposeful year 
Whereas the first couple years maybe could be, you could do the same eight weeks over and over for two years straight with a 1RM or an AMRAP all the time, and it's still going to be able to track your progress pretty objectively because you're not so beat up or so close to your genetic potential or so all the things Brad is. If that makes sense. Yes. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it's it. That's the thing is like um, you know, for a lot. I know that our listeners run the gamut of just trying to get into this stuff, and then also there are people like Brad who, um, that's really important differentiation as to why he would do different things at different times of the year. Um, and would you? Oh, never mind. I was going to ask you a question that involves bodybuilding too, but not. Um, trying to fight with me. I, can I know. That. I wanted to do a comparison, but I'm what trying about to stick with. <laughs> I am. I'm just really trying to make your life hard. That's what I'm trying to do. Um, okay. So with AMRAPs, when you say there's a cap, what are your percentage based caps that you would think of, Brad? Like at what percent do you do your AMRAPs? How low is too low to the point where you're doing too much? Like what's a good range for the average person to reach for if they're trying to do an AMRAP test? I don't know if I Boy, asked you that know, right. That, that's, that's probably a real good question. I think it's almost like, like Eric says, we got to almost like narrow down what's, what's, the, what's the true question there or what's the, what's the right question to ask. Because um, I mean like with me – the way that we do my AMRAPs, I'm, I'm probably never going to get more than five, you know, simply because that's usually the end of a block. The test is somewhere around the 90th percent and uh, 90 percent of one RM. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's strictly our way of kind of gauging progress when, you know, one RMs are not necessarily the goal. Um so that's kind of one end of the spectrum, whereas if you shift to the other end of the spectrum, and let's say we, we've just got our, our, our recreational lifter who's now trying to maybe, or they're thinking about doing some strength sports, and they've never even dabbled, you know, in, in heavy lifting, you know, less than five, you know, much less a 1RM attempt. Um, you know, we may have to, to set up blocks of training to where... You know, maybe maybe this particular block of training, we, we plan for a progression making loads heavier and heavier and heavier. But like the, the lowest amount of reps that we'll get might be seven, six, five, something like that. And then we do an AMRAP test using about that percentage or maybe just a little bit heavier. And then we got to set up the next block to be a little bit heavier, probably a little bit lower reps. And then if the last block that was kind of like slowly, you know, kind of bringing rep targets down from like 1098 to 765, maybe this block we go from like 765 down to like 543 or, you know, 432, something like that. Well, now this block's AMRAP may be more like, you know, if they did have a 1RM, maybe 85, between 85 and 90%. Whereas the last block, maybe it wasn't that heavy. Maybe it was like 80, 85%. So I think it, like Eric said, it depends on the lifter, kind of where you're at in your, your spectrum of, of training. Um, but like Eric was saying, I don't think that we would want to have a, a, a lifter, you know, that was used to doing those seven, sixes, and fives do a really heavy AMRAP. You know what I mean? Pushing those, those you know, one and two RM type of a limits. Um, so I think that's how I would set up, you know, kind of your more recreational lifter. If I'm on this end of the spectrum, always testing AMRAPs at like 90, 95 percent, how you would do it on the other end of the spectrum of a person that's just starting to maybe dabble with strength after, you know, a few years of recreational lifting. Does that answer the question, I hope? Yeah. Andrea? Yeah. So a pretty typical range is 85 to, let's say, 90 maybe 92-ish percent at the most, Eric. And why wouldn't you want to go any lighter? Why wouldn't you just say, well, go for it? Yeah, Brad touched on a few things. And there's a, this almost comes into the, the, the practical side of the programming. Because it's funny, we always talk about percentage of 1RM, but we're, we're always actually talking about percentage of your pre-test 1RM or your estimated 1RM or what we currently think your 1RM is, right? So with a guy like Brad, where he's a highly advanced lifter, 
I kind of know what's a reasonable expectation on him increasing his 1RM by. So I'm very comfortable using percentages. But like if we're talking about the scenario you guys are talking about where it's someone new to strength sport, you tell them to do 90% of their pretest 1RM, they might get like eight reps, which is sometimes quite surprising, uh, you know, compared to an advanced lifter who if they add a rep from what they got in the last eight week block, that'd be good, you know. Mm -hmm. So sometimes what I will do to circumvent that is I won't actually assign a percentage. I'll just write in their sheet, try for a new 5RM. You know, um, that way they're, they're a little more in charge of it instead of me just slaving it to their 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 pretest percentage, um, right. and assuming the person isn't way either on the on, on the mental spectrum of being way too uh, aggressive and ego driven or way too conservative and fearful of being under the bar, and that normally goes pretty well. Like if they're a little conservative, they might get like oh it was actually eight rep max, and if they're too aggressive, maybe it's a, it's a three rep max. But either way. It's, it's, it's in the range of, of what is useful information for me to keep programming them moving forward. So that's a useful way to go about it. Um, but in general, yeah, the, the further you get away from 100% of 1RM, the more variability between individuals you'll get in the number of reps they can perform. There was a, a pretty crazy study out there where they took endurance athletes and strength athletes and they had them do as many reps as possible with 80% of 1RM. And one group got like 12 reps or something like that. Uh, or maybe, maybe even higher than that, I could be wrong, the endurance athletes obviously, uh, which means A, they, they don't know how to set a true 1RM and they're extremely good at endurance based work and then the strength athletes will get a number that we more expect like you know six, seven, eight reps, that kind of thing. So yeah, I don't like to play with anything really much lower than like 85% of pretest 1RM because you get someone who made good gains and who just happens to be very good at reps, like if you were to give Birdo, as an intermediate, he's notoriously good at banging out reps. 85% of his 1RM, he might freak you out and get like 10 reps, despite the fact that that should be like his 5 or 6 rep max. Mm. Um, so maybe you're okay with that. Uh, another way to do this, and this is something that I've heard uh, Dr. Z mention, is that he just simply, he uses plus sets. Uh, he, he calls them plus versus AMRAPs because he often does them after a number of other sets. So for example, he might have you do three sets of four at 80% of 1RM. And then your fourth set, you go for broke on 80% of your 1RM. And then he, what he'll do is just say the cap is twice the number of assigned reps for the day. So if you can, if you get eight, you're just done, right? You, you stop there no matter what. And then he, he uses that to gauge how much he should progress load in the coming weeks. So there, there's a few ways to go about it. Um, and he also makes the point that that's, sometimes an AMRAP can be misrepresentative of your actual performance because it's a, a peaked kind of excited uh, state, um, which you could argue is also very similar to what you'd have at a meet. But at the same time, it, it may not be reflective of, of how the block went. Likewise, that's the argument against doing AMRAPs really regularly because you don't want to have to push your, put yourself in that position and then everything rides on that single day. And you might have had a, a great week of training and just had a one bad day and you could think, Oh, everything's going poorly when in fact you just didn't get no sleep or something. Right. And something you said that's really important is how the block went, right? And I think what um, a disconnect that I find a lot is there is a very, a lot of people don't recognize the difference between we're testing to assess if our training is productive versus how strong are you? Mm -hmm. Right. And I, and, um, I find myself explaining that a lot to my athletes, especially because I'm, I have almost exclusively physique athletes, and we do these AMRAPs to create an estimated 1RM. And although they might pick up a weight they've never picked up for three or four reps, if their 1RM, their estimated 1RM based on the equation didn't go up, they feel like shit. You know, and they don't, and so that's, I think, a really big thing, um, a crux of, of the importance of this podcast is understanding why we why we track the progress right um and for a physique athlete that's even more important right but for um does that happen with your power lifters even more so than your physique athletes brad like do you find because i almost have all physique athletes i i find that that's something that i have to battle a lot because i don't give out a lot of one rms because we don't necessarily need it but I know that you guys do. Um, do your power lifters prefer 1RMs versus AMRAPs, Brad? And do they um, kind of misunderstand the application or the reasoning for it? 
I think, and Eric, you can you can chime in real quickly if you want to. I think all power lifters prefer one RMs, you know, because <laughs> that's that's their competitive lift, you know. Right. <laughs> so I think they I would, all. I would say that that's it. common. I'm sure I'm sure yeah. there's exceptions, but that is pretty common. Yeah. 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 If they um, prefer one RMs, unless they don't go up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's true. Then, That's true. Then there's yeah. the psychological issues that happen. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I think that, yeah, most, we'll say most power lifts would prefer a 1RMs. Um, and, uh, you know, Andrew, refresh my memory. <laughs> what was your question again? <laughs> um, do, do you find that when you give a power lift your AMRAPs that there's almost a like, well, why aren't we testing a 1RM? It, do they do they ask or do they just yes sir coach or are they like not quite understanding of it? Um, is the first yeah, of many? It, it kind of both, kind okay. of both. It, especially like uh, uh, I've, I've actually got a, a a power lifter competing tomorrow, um, who you know we basically never done a true one RM test like an actual one RM attempt on a given day. We've worked up to a single, you know, in training, but we've never. We've never done a true one RM, um, and I mean that's rare. But at the same time, you know, I use it more often than you might think because it's a first-time competitor. You know, we've whatever a one RM test that we've done in the gym is probably you know almost it, it has no bearing on what we're going to do on on competition day. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? So um, yeah, a lot of times lifters like that will say, well. Why aren't we testing a one RM? You know, that's that, that's what I'm going to be doing. You know, um, a lot of times beginners they'll be like, "Well, how can I do a percentage based program if I don't know my one RM?" You know. Yeah. And again, it's it, it was like Eric was saying. You know, your your one RM is probably going to be at most sixty five percent accurate. You know, so how can we do a percentage based program on an inaccurate one RM? You know. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's one end of the spectrum. Yeah, a lot of those power lifters, they, they, they're questioning, why aren't we doing a 1RM yet? You know, and that's why so a lot of times I'll say we need to, we need to get good at doing 1RMs, 2RMs, etc. There's a certain skill to that that most people don't, don't really understand. Um, and then on the flip side of the spectrum, yeah, we've got power lifters that are like, why are we doing AMRAPs right now? You know, and, and, and usually they're asking that like, you know, maybe after a, a competition or maybe even like a, in a blogger training after competition, you know, like, why aren't we testing 1RMs? We're going to be competing in 1RMs. And I'm like, well, let's think about this rationally. You're not going to be competing for a while now. You know, do we really need to be testing that skill now? Likewise, is it even worthwhile to be doing low volume training now when, you know, we need to be building work capacity and we need to be building all this workload, right? Um, and then of course the frustrating part is like, okay, now I'll, coach, I've changed my mind. I want to do a, a meet in eight weeks, you know, <laughs> so yeah. should we be testing one RMs, you know? And I'm like, Oh Lord, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yes and no, but you know, and so, um, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's two ends of, of, of the, the spectrum there. And, and, you know, a lot of times it just takes the, the particular circumstance. It takes the, the context of the, the athlete, the context of the training, the context of the competition schedule. Um, you know, and, and, and tracking progress can certainly vary, you know, just in the calendar, you know, much less on the, on the athlete. Good point. Go ahead, Eric. Are you going to say something? Uh, no, I was just going to echo mostly what, what Brad said. I think so much it comes down to, like, communicating the purpose, the why, and the how of mm -hmm. your program to your athlete. Um, because if you, yeah, I mean, if you just like with, with Brad, I, I give him an eight week program and, and he contacts me if there's an issue, but with, you know, my, my less savvy, Brad's especially savvy. He's, he's coaching alongside me and for, for a long time and he's an experienced lifter. So, you know, when I'm working with a lifter on a week to week basis, I'm, you know, talking about them, what you can expect going into next week. Hey, you know, here's a deload. Uh, if you have to miss a day, that's not the end of the world and blah, 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 things like that. You know, the context every week is important. Um, and there's back and forth and questions. And, and, you know, when I write them a new block, I typically make a video and explain to them why we're doing each thing. And I go, you know, we'll, we'll last test, you know, the, um, it seemed like 
when, when we increased the, the load for you to test, you didn't perform very well. And I think that's just because we didn't have enough heavy lifting and you, you it seems to be your squat. We need to be keeping some element of heaviness. And so now on our, our uh, hypertrophy day, we're opening up with a, a single at an eight and then we're going to do 80% of that to do our, our rep work or something like that, you know? So that can all be explained and they understand why. Um, and I sit down with them before I even write the program and go, okay, when are we competing? And then I'll go, okay, so here's the plan. We'll have a couple eight week blocks and we'll have a six week build up to your meet after that. So all of that should be communicated to your athlete ahead of time. So they don't feel like there's a disconnect or they don't think you don't know what you're doing, you know, and, and uh, then they can understand that, oh, we're, we're, it's very difficult to build volume with triples and it would behoove me to, you know, develop more muscle mass to be stronger. So we're going to spend some time trying to do that. And then it would be disheartening for me to test when I'm strength, when I've been doing eights, because I'm not going to be good at it. Oh, it all makes sense now. So I think that that's part of your job as a coach is to make sure that they understand your line of thinking um, or they won't have buy-in. Yeah. I like that you said, because when we've been doing a bunch of eights, we don't want to want to run because we're not good at it. So can we talk about... Um one RM is a skill for a little bit, and when you say not good at it, what are all the things that contribute to being good at it, Eric? Yeah, or practiced, yeah. so, whichever. Right, right. So, I mean, there's some, there's some cool research that we've done that, that just shows that uh, when novice lifters who haven't done a lift for a while try to gauge their one RM, they typically overshoot and, and, and miss. And the, the, the final heaviest rep they complete isn't done as slow as you'd expect the one RM to be completed. Um, and that, to me, indicates that they really just don't have the uh, the skill, and I'll, I'll, I'll use skill to encompass things like neuromuscular adapt adaptations, uh, psychological confidence, um, and ability to hold position and not bail when things start to go a little wonky, because you're not you, know, you don't know to trust your your body yet because you haven't practiced it. Um, but yeah, I mean, if if you if we can all remember back to way when we very first started lifting, um, if I was to do a heavy triple, they all kind of felt the same. But like now I can tell when I'm, when I'm near, like I would do three hard reps and they were all grinders and I'd be like, oh sweet. And I'd go up next week and I'd be able to go up. Now I can very efficiently and effectively tell how far from failure I am just because I've, I've been training a long time. So, um, that has to do with true changes in your sensory awareness and your neuromuscular system. And, um, those are not just changes that happen once you've been training for a while, but they're acute relative to what you've done. So if you have been doing heavy lifting, you're going to be acutely good at heavy lifting because of the adaptations you've had. And if you've been doing high rep training, you're going to be having all these metabolic adaptations in the, uh, the local muscle to allow you to, you know, to buffer fatigue, basically, to do more reps. So testing either one of those things when they are not well adapted um, and expecting to see progress relative to sometime last year or three months ago when you were good at it is probably just a recipe for frustration. Um, and... Yeah. And, you know, an, another side of the whole camp, the counter argument to everything Brad and I have been saying is, uh, well, you know, hypertrophy is not that important and volume is not very important for building strength. Uh, and strength is really primarily a skill. Therefore, you should just train the skill all the time. Um, and I don't think that's true, but but there are some schools of thought that would, would do that. And they're just basically uh, always training uh, low volume, perhaps high frequency, but high intensity. Um, and I would say there are some, some significant downsides to that, um, because every unit of volume you do is high risk and stressful. Yeah. Emotionally. Um, so how, uh, damn it. I had something, but then something else came in. Um, how often would you say is too often to test a one rep max in your opinion? Then if you're, if you don't think that the other way of like doing a one rep every day is efficient, how often do you think would make it efficient or useful? Um, well, it's going to be so context dependent. I mean, okay, it, it depends let's on do, when are you competing. All right, let's do, um, I started lifting two years ago. I'm about to do my first meet and then let's do Brad and then let's do Bryce. Okay. So let's say you, you just started lifting. You were doing, we're doing our first meet. Mm -hmm. um, you're not going to get to attempt a, a one RM before your first meet. If you train with me, you're going to be, building up, building up, and you'll practice openers about a week out. Um, and openers, in my opinion, are a triple you can hit in a blizzard. You know, it's something we definitely get, get on the board. The second attempt should also probably be a lock. Uh, that's roughly something you can hit in a 9 RPE. 
and then we will have an agreed upon strategy for going for our third attempts. But the goal for my first lifters is to go nine for nine and build the best total they can. And they will probably be doing PBs for singles, personal best or PRs, depending on you know which terminology you like better. But I doubt that they would be true one RMs like like Brad was saying with a novice mm -hmm. lifter. There's no reason to test your limits when you're advancing so quickly as a novice. Um, you're not trying to get every last kilo on the platform because you've been lifting for 30 years and you're going for a world record. You're, I mean, what, what are you doing that for? Like, I really want to squat 350 pounds. Like, well, in two years you're gonna be squatting 550. So why do we care? Like, yeah. just go up two and a half kilos or five pounds every meet you do on your lifts, and you'll be putting on a, a vast amount of weight on your total every year and ingraining good habits and not pushing yourself to the point where uh, you're risking injury or or potentially just. Stressing yourself out for no reason when you can just, you know, eat up all your progress. And um, people also forget that putting a lot of energy into the, the squat can affect the deadlift, you know. So, you know, going for broke and having a 0.1 meter per second velocity squat might mean that you're going to pull five kilos less on your deadlift. So, you know, again, the, the goal on the platform, this is really all for Matt Gary to give him credit, is to build the total, not to get PRs. Um, so that, that's, that's, your, that's your novice. The next category of person was Brad. Brad, which might be a little too close to Bryce, but they differ quite yeah. a bit. Go ahead. They're, yeah, they're very different lifters. Um, but um, yeah, you know, for, for Brad, we would probably be hitting... Or would me be better? I don't know. I haven't coached you, so I, well, I, I don't I know Well, I meant my uh, not novice, but not Brad. That's what I was going okay, for so with that. Okay, so how about not your first meet, but you're an intermediate power lifter? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. In that case, you, you might be hitting a 1RM and say your your last block of training before your block leading into the, the meet. So say maybe you know 12 to 16 weeks out, I might have you practice some 1RM, so do a mock meet. And then you know we'd have a build up and, and practice openers. And then the week after that, go again, you know, eight weeks, nine weeks later, somewhere, somewhere in there. That's typically the approach I would take. So be doing AMRAPs in the first couple months of the year, and you'd be doing heavy ram wraps the next couple. And then let's say we're 16 weeks out from training. Then we do maybe doubles or potentially even a mock meet. And then in your final buildup, you would actually do a, uh, you know, a one RM and a, yeah. and a meet. So like maybe three times a year if I just had Probably, power yeah. lifting goals. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If, like, like if you think of the most aggressive scenario, if you have three meets that you're doing in a year um, and you're pretty well advanced, you might do it four times. Right. Like once before that first meet, and then, and then each meet, then you just spread blocks out between the meets, you know, and probably not test any more outside of actual competition. Um, so, but that, that's like the most I can see that being a, a strategy. Um, not not to say that you can't take different approaches. Like, I'm sure the the Bulgarian weightlifting team would be sitting here going, "I don't agree with this," you know, like, and and yeah, you can't argue with. Well, their I'm success. not even powerlifting, and when I'm healthy, I think we we ran some cycles where I did it like every four weeks. This yeah, year, I, like in the last year, yeah. So I know it's different, but if I was exclusively powerlifting, um, that was just my, I wanted your opinion well, for yeah. that. You answered I, it perfectly. I just want to put the disclaimer out there that you could create a certainly a very reasonable approach to training where you did 1RMs on a more, much more regular basis, mm -hmm. assuming that seeing those fluctuations doesn't psychologically bother you, which is right. a few lifters. Right. The cost is often not worth the benefit in my experience of having lifters uh, test their limits on a regular basis because they can't deal with the fact that their limits shift on a day-to-day -day basis. Oh, that's and a great they, point. They yeah. overbuy into the, the bad days and uh, overbuy into the good days too. So they, you give them a fucking fantastic random Thursday and they, that's what they want their, their opener or their, <laughs> if they're crazy or their third attempt to be if they're a little more reasonable, but neither one's really a reasonable thing. Right. Or they question the, the, the validity of the entire block of training because of a random Thursday where mm -hmm. they lost 15 kilos on their deadlift, you know? Yeah. And I, I'm like that to some degree, even with the experience I have. So I, I, I fail to see how someone who's been training a year and who's maybe 10 years younger than me is going to, on average, have the maturity to, to be doing regular maxing without that having a negative effect psych yeah. psychologically. Yeah, it's so important, I think, for, for all of us to always remember that we're not, um, we're different levels of strong on different days. Mm -hmm. It's not like I am this strong and I am always this strong whether you wake me up at 3 a.m. or whether it's 3 p.m. or whether I slept or whether I peed or whether I'm at a meet or whether I'm at home. Like, um, 
hence RPE. Yeah. Well, even then, though, like stronger is different than stronger. Am I stronger than I used to be? Doesn't mean like, um, am I stronger than yesterday? Like those are just very different questions, I guess. Um, um, hey, Andrea, I'm going to yeah. chime in real quick if you Please. don't mind before yeah. before Eric starts talking about you know the the Bryce you know mutant level <laughs> lifter. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of times where um, we may stumble upon a one RM. You know. Right. Um, I think a lot of times, especially, you know, beginner lifters, but then some, some intermediate lifters, you know, like yourself, um, you know, they're not very good at one RMs. And so I might plan like a heavy double and I'll say, okay, you've done, we've done all this work and you know, here, here's what we're going to do. We're going to plan for, for two doubles. We're going to plan for two sets of two mm -hmm. and you've got the leeway. If that first double felt pretty darn good you know, to, um, go up a little bit on the second double. And then guess what? On the second double, they can't get their second rep. They got a really good first rep that is now essentially our, our one RM. I love it when people are successful at all their attempts at one RMs and they don't fail. So often people will try to find that ceiling. We're testing a one RM. Well, I keep doing heavier until I fail. Mm -hmm. And then the one that I got was my, was my, is now my one RM. That's one way of doing it, but in, in my opinion, that's a very kind of a negative way, yeah. or at least it's kind of a, it's, it's like negative reinforcement. I love it when we stumble upon a one RM. We've got planned for the day two doubles, um, and, and a lot of times I will purposely do that instead of saying, "Okay, we're testing for a single this day." You know, I mean, because a lot of times that is the mindset is that we're going to test, test, test till we fail. We can't get this. We got this. This is our one RM. You know, and mm -hmm. that was. That way, now we've got a new way of tracking progression. You know what I mean? Because well, we're probably going to revisit these doubles again later on. Um, maybe now what we got for one last time, we'll get for the double this time. Or maybe we'll stumble upon a new 1RM. That's that's a, a, a very, in my opinion, a very effective technique for, and especially someone like you, who, you know, you tend to kind of, you know, mind fuck yourself when you get <laughs> underneath that heavy bar, you know, yeah. if I give you something that's a heavy double, guess what? It turned into a single. Oh, there's our one RM, you know, yeah. but might you might, you know, get that double too. We're done. We don't yeah. need to test a, a, a single today. Let's wait till the end of the next block. So yeah. with that, I'll let Eric expand on that or, you know, go into the mutants that are out there. I can, uh, I can go a little more into what you said about me though, in that, Things I, I, I have noticed, right, that um, Berto took that approach with me going into my first powerlifting meet, and I hit all PRs um, other than the bench press, which I didn't reach, which was a whole nother, neither here nor there. Um, like, I physically didn't reach the bar, Eric. The bench was <laughs> too high. <laughs> he had to pick it up and give it to me. <laughs> it was embarrassing. Um, but my, not, yeah. Not a USAPL meet, obviously. No, it was not. It was important. It was back, back. The backyard me. <laughs> yeah. I didn't reach. Um, but anyways, I did. Uh, and so that, that did work, right? And then uh, when I hurt my shoulder at the beginning of, oh, God, it was, oh, my God, it was a year ago. Okay, so that's when we ran, um, uh, like, I guess, 10 weeks of, of very high intensity, like, power lifting back squat or whatever. And by the end of that, I, have, I feel like I improved my squat ability and deadlift. Um, I don't think I ever lost it. I, I, it was the first time I had done AMRAPs and it was, it was often and it was three days a week. And by the end of it, I felt stronger, more confident than ever. And I, and I still hold, I hold that pretty well for that lift. But what's funny is, um, cause that was my first like intensity attack at that thing. Right. And it worked out and, and I developed all those things. And then a couple months later, a few months later, shoulders healed. I get to Olympic lifting and I'm the opposite with Olympic lifting. I do it much better if I'm rested um, if I'm not freaking out, whereas like if I do too much high intensity Olympic lifting, I feel like it gets shittier. Whereas like when it was my squat, it got better. Um, I'm sure Eric, you could speak to why that is, but, um, it's just more skill dependent. I, I think it's, yeah, that too. But I also think there's, I lost the fear of the squat back then. And now because Olympic is new, I still feel like a little bit, holy shit. I hope they make this whenever it's like a squat. It's like, I know I can make this. Um, yeah, I mean, squats can be scary, but not like, I would say 
clean a heavy, jerk scary. <laughs> a heavy ass clean or snatch recovery, uh-huh. probably more snatch is scarier. <laughs> yeah. Because it can snap your elbow in half and then drop in your neck. So. Thanks for that. That wasn't what I was thinking at all. Anyway, enjoy your, enjoy your <laughs> next training, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's a. Uh, it, it's it's different. Like we we've talked about skill development, but now that I have both of those, like within a year in my arsenal or whatever, like one, if it's like the worst that can happen is for me on the squat, I just like crumble and fall forward. Um, I just crumble to the rack. Whereas if I like you said, I'm a snatch. Like where am I gonna throw it? And if it's a clean, it's too far back on me. Do I fall backwards? Do I throw it and jump back? Like what? Do I, jerks too. I have like this weird thing where I'm like, if I drop this down, it's gonna fall on my knee. Like I have. I'm not so terrified that I'm crippled, but I, I, in my brain, things can happen, and it's... Just watch that video where the guy breaks his femur when he drops the jerk on his side. Oh, I'll my God. <laughs> I, can't, I can't watch those. I cannot uh, watch those. Fortunately, Andrea, you're not a super heavyweight Russian lifter, so you're not going to drop 200 <laughs> kilos on your thigh. But Maybe. Um, one day. Just kidding. One day, you will be in a lot of gear. <laughs> 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 um, that's... That, that would be the most incredible thing in the world to hear jerk for <laughs> No, because I did all that gymnastic stuff, and I would watch things sometimes, and, and I would end up okay. It's, it's scarier to watch than it is to feel with scary things like that. Yeah, because you, you can think a lot more when you're sitting there watching a video. In the middle of a lifting, you're not as cerebral. Yeah. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on that, that Brad talked about was um, the typical approach to 1RM testing of just going up in small increments until you fail. Mm-hmm. That's basically if you whip out any personal training manual or the NSCA CSCS handbook, that's what it tells you to do. It's you know warm up with like 30, 50, then 70 percent, then 80 percent, and then from there you just make just absolute load increases of like 10 pounds or five kilos or something like that. And that is the standard way of testing 1RM in exercise science. Yeah. And something that powerlifters know that that probably the average lifter doesn't know, or the average exercise scientist unfortunately doesn't know, is that that will actually result in a lower 1RM than if you were to make more intelligent jumps. Yeah. Uh, and the critique that an exercise scientist would give is, well, unless you actually hit failure when attempting a 1RM, you don't know what your max is after a small jump. And they're just kind of forgetting how fatiguing a grinding heavy single is. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, the uh, the original paper that Zerdos and I did, well, primarily Zerdos in his lab, and I was a part of it, that was on the, the RPE scale, was also basically a paper on hey guys, here's how we should be testing 1RMs. Use velocity, use this RPE scale, and get them as close to a max as you can um, in as few jumps as possible, but reasonable jumps so that you minimize fatigue so you get more out of them. And I can definitely say that you can uh, get more out of somebody making intelligent jumps versus just going until you absolutely break, you know? Yeah. And the, the resultant fatigue in a training program, man, can you imagine if you end up with a max of 400, but you did... 340, 350, 360, 370, 380, 385, 390, 395, 400, and then missed 405? Fuck. You know, that, that, would, that would wreck yeah. me for, for a while, you know. That's how we did, uh, yeah, at, at, in our lab, we would, do, we would test, like, um, leg press strength with... Um, I think I I can't 100% accurately. I think they got three tries to find their 1RM and they got to pick it. And we asked them, how much more weight do you think you can do? And let's do it again. And we have to wait five minutes. And how much more weight do you think you can do? And um, Three tries isn't too bad. I've seen much worse. (laughs) Well, but they got to pick it. And it's like, I I, I mean, it took me years to figure out what five five extra pounds versus 15 extra pounds feels like when it's like 80% or more. Right, it it took me a while, and these when are I people that like off the street. <laughs> yeah. yeah. When I want to RM test powerlifters, mm-hmm. uh, they have a lot of input on what on what they're going to attempt. When I want to RM test resistance trained participants, I choose. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I forget about that. You don't um, blast from the past. Okay, um, powerlifting. Did we want to let Eric speak on the mutants? There we go. Thanks, Brad. I had no idea what I, what we were doing for like a minute there. Right. You know, you know, the funny thing is it wouldn't be that much different than the example I gave of the pretty experienced powerlifter. The, the different thing with the mutants or high-level powerlifters is just that they often have something extremely unique to them or 
what be it psychological or physiological that you have to take into account. Um, I would say one thing that is very similar between Bryce and, and Brad is they both do very well training submaximally, and they're very consistent lifters. Um, I would say, and, and I'm, Bryce has talked about this. Bryce, the one thing is he's very um, psychologically dependent on how his training go, goes. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important for him not to miss reps. So if anything, I'm a little more conservative with the loads because uh, it, it it'll give him ammunition to to psych himself out if he has grinders when he's not used to that or expecting it. Mm -hmm. So um, testing will often go to a nine and I'll be very strategic with thinking about how the test will affect him. Um, and I, I'm pretty sure he's comfortable with me saying that. We've talked about it publicly before and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, it, it's not that it's a different formula when you're at a certain level or that you're super genetically gifted. It's really that at that level, it's just individual differences become magnified as all of the standard characteristics become more and more controlled for, if that makes sense. You How know? many so, years have you been with Bryce? Eight. Okay. So I think that's important to say. We've, we've said a lot like, well, if you're this kind of lifter, if you're this kind of lifter, and like, it takes a long time to know what kind of lifter. Yeah, like, yeah. Like a long, long time. Um, some lifters don't even know that. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I'm learning about myself more and more every six months. Like, it's... Yeah. So, it's, yeah, a yeah. lot of times, if you if you don't know that as a lifter, your coach isn't going to know that, you know? Yep. So, Very true. That's, a lot, that's, a, that's a lot of experience that has to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, are you flexing right now, Eric? Bodybuilding time. Oh, is that what that meant? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sure. I thought you were just trying to show me your muscles in the middle of eating. I thought you were trying to show me the gains going from your mouth to your bicep. That's what I thought you were doing. Well, I did want to brighten everyone's day with a with a bicep shot, but Under more Under a t-shirt. You were just telling me I to had, move on. Yeah, I can take my shirt off if you want, but that's not appropriate. But um, I was more so just, I was chewing, so I couldn't say bodybuilding, so I wanted to flex to give the signal. Okay. Yes. Um, all right. So about bodybuilding. Yeah. Bodybuilding. Um, this, I think it's even more apparent or it should be that your testing is literally just to see how we're doing. Would you agree with that? Bryce, Bryce, whoever he's on this call apparently do. Uh, would you agree with that, Brad? <laughs> I'm sorry. Can you repeat that? I said, would you agree that with uh, with bodybuilding, it's even more, uh, it's easier to argue that we are really just testing to make sure that we are headed in the right direction rather than like, is your objective 1RM going up or your objective AMRAP or whatever? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I to be honest with you, my bodybuilders, I don't do very many 1RM tests. I really yeah. can say that, you know. Uh, Eric, what about you? Do you do ever very many with your bodybuilders? I don't do no. it. We shoot for two to five RMs most of the time with me. Yeah, it's always it's always a, a set a new three to six RM kind of thing. Yeah. Is what I typically yeah. do. Um, yeah, or two to five. It doesn't really matter. But yeah, the yeah, I mean the only, I mean I, we work with so many dual athletes that sometimes I'm like, well, yeah, oh no, he's a powerlifter. Well, yeah, no, he's a powerlifter. <laughs> too, you know. Yeah. But my pure bodybuilders, no. No, it's always, and sometimes I'm very comfortable with them setting new 10 rep maxes or things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll talk about that too. Okay, so we did, I think regardless of the lifter's goal, we we now understand the, the crux and the purpose of 1RMs and, and AMRAPs, right? Um, but then let's let's talk about the other ways that we can still numerically uh, track progress, which should be like just volume calculations over time, right? So we could do it throughout the program, and also within a specific set, like you said, a 10 or a, um, or a set volume PR, like a, oh, you're excited. Okay, swallow your food and then tell us about what you're excited about. Swallow. Okay. okay. I think this is cool because um, there's a lot of controversy around this in the scientific community as to whether or not strength is representative of hypertrophy. Okay. And depending on who you talk to and what study you read, you can see modest correlations between strength going up with hypertrophy or very surprisingly low correlations. Um, typically though, the more you constrain the model, the more you say, right, we're working with 
a lifter with the same skill level with the lift, and that's probably not going to change. We're working with a controlled training program, and there's communication between the coach and athlete. We're not looking at a group. We're looking at a single individual. Um, then you can be more and more confident that one should be representative of the other, assuming you're not all of a sudden switching to singles. Like if you took a bodybuilder who'd been training with tens, and even if you cut their volume in half or a third, down to a third rather, but started giving them singles, their one arm would probably go up, and they'd even see a, probably a reduction in, in, in muscle mass to right. some degree. Um, and you go like, oh my god! And then therefore, hypertrophy can't predict strength. How can one go down when the other one goes up? It's because it's just a single component, right? So. Obviously, like if you took a car and you put a more powerful engine into it and the more powerful engine weighed more, that aspect of doing that would make the car slower, having a heavier engine. But the more powerful engine would result in a net increase in its speed. That's kind of the same thing of looking at how one component could uh, effectively go down while the system's going up. Anyway, so, it, but it's very true that even with the if we take like the largest estimates for how much hypertrophy contributes to strength, it is still one of many components and not a major one, in my opinion. But it is a good way to also gauge just how much fatigue the person is under. Mm. Like you said, Andrea, you if you are looking at their total work performed, that's probably a greater indicator of the, the hypertrophic potential of a program. So if someone is, you're not really seeing visual changes over long-term periods when you're seeing the pictures from, from your client, and their strength is, yeah, you know, more or less going up, and then all of a sudden it just stops, uh, and you've increased their volume a bunch, that may say, hey, yeah, this is plenty to make them grow, but it's so much that they can't recover their force production. That might be an indication that you're having them do too much acutely, or that right. you need to do more frequent deloads, or you need to organize their training differently so that, um, you know, they're not fatigued at the end of a cycle to the extent that where well, they can't perform. Um, so it's not that you necessarily care about the performance, but the quality of that performance tells you the state of their recovery, um, and it can tell you whether generally things are going in the right direction. Right. All good points. So um, also too late with the, me being like five minutes late on the powerlifters do 1RMs, bodybuilding, right? We are, that is the goal. Hypertrophy is the goal. Looking different is the goal. And if... Um, there's plenty, I'd say still probably in this day and age, most bodybuilders don't even test like 1RMs or AMRAPs. They just keep going. They just keep going till they can do 5x5 five five with 100 when it used to be 90 kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's funny how, um, including myself for a long time when I, I still wasn't even powerlifting yet, it's just I... I I wanted to be stronger and that was how I gauged my progress because you can't see yourself grow fast enough. You know, like it's I know like that watching, it's like watching paint dry. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I, it is important though for people not to get it twisted because this was something I was even a victim to is I, I had it, it, it reversed in my head as to what caused what. Right. Okay. So instead, of, like now, I understand that because hypertrophy is a component of strength, that if my strength is continually going up in the context of a of, of a program that makes sense for hypertrophy, that means I'm probably making progress. It's a it's a useful marker. But back in back in the day, I would buy into that the wrong way and go, right. So if high, if strength is a marker for hypertrophy, that means that if I can set up a program to get as strong as possible, that means I, I'm also getting as big as possible. Right. And I don't know if I thought into it too much, but I, but I, I had it backwards. Like, oh, if I can get stronger, then, then therefore that'll help me grow. And it's like, well, not necessarily. You need to be stressing your muscles and putting tension on them relative to their size, because then the bigger they get, they can handle more tension. And you need to, you know, get enough muscle activation and create a stimulus for growth. And in that process, you're probably going to get stronger. So you will probably need to use heavier loads to continue to provide that stress. Mm -hmm. So, so. Strength gain almost happens as, as, as a side effect of training for hypertrophy. Um, and if it's not going up, then that's probably not, not a good sign or, or, or long term. But it's not what's causing it. So right. it's just a useful thing not to get mixed up. Right. And then you also have the flip side of what Eric was too. And I've, I've, you know, luckily I didn't fall into this just because of how I was groomed uh, in my early days of lifting. But you'll have a lot of you know, pretty good bodybuilders that will find, well, I, 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 I need to keep my volume going up and I can't do it 
uh, using these heavier and heavier loads. So pretty soon they're just doing endless repetitions with, you know, we'll just say lightweight, it, not appropriate for their strength levels. And, and essentially they're just getting all this garbage volume in of rep after rep after rep after rep. And um, I mean, it, I guess it kind of makes sense if you're thinking of it in terms of absolutes. But, um, you know, Eric alluded to this in, in a great bo- podcast with Lane and, and um, Mike Israel when they had their their I think it was their volume roundtable or something like that. How, you know, the, the volume has to be a, a representative of, of your appropriate strength levels. And it's not just volume, you know, and it's not just strength it's it's building work capacity and building work um that you know just that workload over time and you you can't you can't segregate these two things in order for the whole program to be progressing um and so you know a lot of times that's why i I get that's the, the the lifter i start getting a little bit more dependent on the numbers you know if they're a beginner I don't need volume calculations and tonnages and intensity yeah. and stuff like that i can just look at the amount of reps that they're doing in the the, the load that they're using, see it going up, and it's it's working. Those athletes, though, where I need to see, okay, well, here we've got an average intensity of 76%. Here we've got an average of intensity of 68%. It, it's, 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 and that's probably too close of a, of a sample size, but if I made it more obvious, if this one here we've got tonnages that are 12,000 at 78%, and here we've got 13,000 at 40, that, that's the reason that your program is no longer working and you're not seeing the same amount of gains that you you saw hypertrophy wise when you first started um mm-hmm. and that's when i need to get a little bit more dependent upon those numbers over time yeah we, we did th- those are all great points and you know not to go too far down the mechanisms of hypertrophy thing but intensity does have some role and it's not necessarily just the load on the bar but it has to be something that actually fatigues you just i mean like, like brad was saying if you did thirteen thousand pounds a volume at an average of 40% of your 1RM, that probably wouldn't be very effective compared to what he was saying in, in, in the 70s and even doing less volume. So it's important not to get twisted that volume is the only thing that matters. It doesn't because you know, we can just look at an endurance athlete. You know, they're, they're moving their body weight and through contractions, through space, just like if they're holding onto a barbell, just different movements. But they're not going to hypertrophy from that tons and tons of volume they had because they're not going to anywhere near muscular failure from that. Maybe long-term cardiovascular fatigue, but they're not anywhere near momentary muscular failure uh, or they wouldn't be able to run, you know, the 26 miles they're supposed to do. So you can make super low reps work, but that means you've got to be pushing to like an 8 RPE with these 40% one arm loads. So what are you doing? 35 reps per (laughs) set. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Which that's a fantastic way to, you know, throw up your pre-workout meal. Not really a fantastic way to to grow long term, in my opinion. So yeah, it make, it, it's much more efficient um, to stay in kind of the middle ground than going too heavy or too light because you get a bunch of garbage volume doing really, really light light rep work. And for the heavy work, that's really strenuous volume to be getting in if you want to get in 13,000 pounds at 90% of one RM, you know? Right. And so rather than being always too heavy or always too light, we would like to see both. Not, too, not either, but uh, a lighter side and, and the heavier side. Yeah. Um, with the percentage of work being heavier most often for the power lifter and being not absurdly heavy most of the time for the bodybuilder, right? Um, sure. And let's say other than um, volume over time with appropriate intensities and other than multi-rep sets or or again like I guess volume PRs or if your three by three is heavier now than it was three months ago kind of thing um can we talk about the physique measurements measurements and and and, um appearance like ways that you guys um assess using using the the looks and and the diameter mm-hmm. circumference all that yeah just how do you measure the gains is what i'm is what i'm trying to ask i like to get videos like every three months or so of the person from your off-season athletes mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. contest prep it's you know you, you got what you got man we'll see how you do when you're on stage and what your body weight is and what you look like right. and if it was better than the last time we did something right if it was leaner but you look a little smaller then maybe we need to you know make the diet a little less intensive or assess whether we were, you know, 
not pushing hard enough in the off season or whatever, leaving gaps. But yeah, the, of it's, it's funny. The, obviously what you look like is more important and all you need to know is listen to Jeff talking about how he doesn't really do strength testing and he has progressed fantastically to, to realize the importance of that. But at the same time, it's this convergence of two issues. One is the measurement error and the time course needed to see progress when you're doing visual assessments versus the fact that it happens to be the most accurate assessment of whether you're making progress. So it's it's this problem of, yeah, the only thing you care about is what you look like, but that's only something you can reliably check to see visible changes in at a high level maybe twice a year. Yeah. And then you have to be savvy enough to be able to see it through body fat, through changes in, in glycogen fullness, and through your emotional bias. Um, and there's, it's hard to do. So you yeah. know what I like to get is you know similar conditions – uh, evenly spread out uh, video from the client that I assess for them um, compared to the last video. I'll bring up both videos and be like, all right, this is three months ago. This is now. Okay. I think we, we've maybe made some slight gains in the areas we're specializing in. And it's easier to confine it to a single body part. Yeah, I think it's easier to confine it to a single body part after specializing versus just gauging the whole thing mm -hmm. uh, in non-novices. So it's harder to do and it's more subjective. And I'm not a fan of measurements either as much as our bodybuilding community loves them just because body fat changes so much and all this other stuff and and again a measurement is another look we're not going to see hypertrophy change much uh, over short periods anyway so you're trying to measure a, a girth that's going to have a small change plus girths are very hard to do effectively I'm actually a yeah. certified anthropometrist and I know how bad even experienced personal trainers are at it because that's what I was before I got certified and had to do like, you know, 20 tests with a certain technical area measurement. And now I've done it in studies. It's very difficult to get accurate measurements, mm -hmm. even more so on yourself. Um, and then you have to do it under similar conditions. So that's unlikely. So A, the measurement is not going to show much of a change. The technical error is going to be higher than that change most of the time unless you're waiting a very long period. And that doesn't even really matter. It does have to do with what you look like. So why not just go by, by visual? It's, yes, it's more subjective, but at the same time, um, it's probably more predictive of your actual performance on a bodybuilding stage. Right. Brad? Yeah, and then go I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to echo pretty much what Eric said and then kind of expand on it a little bit. You know, it's, you, again, we've got this spectrum, you know, of all these different type of athletes. Um, you know, a, 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 an athlete that's just getting into to you know lifting weights and in, in, in you know that 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 sport, um, we can probably get videos and pictures, you know maybe at the end of every block, you know at the end mm -hmm. of, of ten weeks of training, and then maybe get another one at the at the next ten weeks. Um, you know a lot of times new lifters that's enough time, uh, yeah. you know to see to see changes. Um, I just met with a gal here on, on Skype here a couple weeks ago that just finished her first block. She's been doing powerlifting forever and ever and ever. And this is like her first block of actual bodybuilding training. And um, I didn't even need to see her. I could hear it in her voice. She was ecstatic. She's like, <laughs> it's been nine weeks now, and I finally look like the CrossFitters. You know, those <laughs> famous CrossFit gals with the abs, you know, and the big legs and everything, you know, and yeah. they got the lats. And she was ecstatic. I didn't even need to see her. That's 10 weeks. That's her first bodybuilding block. She has never done a bodybuilding block before. She's been doing like three years of powerlifting, you know. Um, however, like Eric was saying, a lot of our bodybuilders, they're a little bit more experienced. They're a little bit more advanced. The changes are going to be slower. They're going to be more like watching paint dry. You know, we probably do need to say, okay, let's run an entire macro cycle of training, whatever our focus is there. Uh, get, our, get our video before, you know, that particular macro cycle and then another video at the end maybe the macro cycle is 20 weeks 24 weeks whatever okay um you know and, and we'll be able to see things you know or see changes you know there and then we just visit that like you know maybe shoot i don't know three times a year or something like mm -hmm. that um then you've got your your really high level bodybuilders like jeff um you know probably even like Berto to a certain extent now not only do we need to see you know some videos that are far apart like that we need to see actual poses you know, when you're a high level, high level bodybuilder, you know, and Jeff was trying to see significant changes in his back, specifically the width of his back. We needed to see him in his symmetry poses and his rear lat spreads like the beginning of 2011 and then 
in the middle of 2011 and then like the end of 2011 in order to actually see, okay, that was a significant improvement and we needed to see it in those time frames in that pose. You know what I mean? And then you got, of course, compare kind of apples to apples. It has to be in pretty similar body fat. Mm -hmm. Because like Eric said, you know, the girth of something can grow. Well, if you gain three pounds, not all that muscle. You know, there's some fat that's on in there, too, that's made that girthy as well. And as we all know, fat takes up a lot of space. Um, So, yeah, that's just expanding on what Eric said and kind of, you know, putting that in the context of the different athletes that, that, you know, we need to see. But, you know, like Eric, measurements, I, I do not like measurements. I really don't even like, some people will, will use calipers, you know. You have to maintain your body fat. You have to maintain your body fat, you know, in, in order to see the, those changes if your muscles are actually getting bigger, stretching the, the skin tighter, you know. And it's, the fatter you are, the less accurate it is. You've got to maintain really, really lean. I don't, I'm not a big fan of that really either. Right. Um, I, I think people just don't appreciate how slowly muscle growth occurs, unfortunately. Yeah. Like, uh, just for reference, like, uh, the way I measure that in a study is with ultrasound. You know, I'm like an ultra, ultra, ultrasound mm-hmm. scan to get a muscle thickness measure. Oh, yeah, well, you can do cross-sectional area, or, or even just more simply, is just you get the ultrasound image and you just track measure from, out. yeah, where, where the aponeurosis, if it's a muscle on top of another muscle, or where the bone is to the top before the subcutaneous fat layer, and you just measure millimeters. And like in an eight-week study with trained individuals who can – at least bench press 1.25 times their body weight and squat 1.5 times their body weight. They've had two years of lifting, uh, males. A good increase in like quad thickness would be like four millimeters. <laughs> yeah. Get a ruler and look at what four millimeters is, and tell me you're going to be able to pick that out in the mirror in eight weeks. So it kind of tells you yeah. it's going to take a while to really be able to visually assess changes. So. Well, can you just for uh, for our sake, why, like, Andy? C- he very publicly uses measurements. Can you talk about Andy the reason? Uses it for fat right. loss, though. And okay. I think, yeah, and that 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 actually makes more sense to me because fat does take up more space, like like Brad said, and that can change very fast. Like, for example, uh, you can lose one percent of your body mass per week, and that will probably likely all be all fat if you're not too low in body fat, and if you are, um, you know, having an effective resistance training program. That means a guy like me, I could lose freaking two pounds in a week that would probably show up on, on on a waist measurement if it's predominantly from you know an area where i store most of my fat and um andy andy teaches his clients how to specifically do an accurate waist measurement and you know you can take the best of three or an average and then look at that and i think that can be very useful and that's useful because changes in scale weight are heavily modified by hydration and so are calipers and, and measurements of girth but less so right. um so I, I think for fat loss, yeah, sure, you can make an argument for uh, doing a waist measurement as a as as, as, a, as a probably a pretty good, or maybe a hip measurement for a for male. A woman. Yeah, I was gonna say for a male. Yeah, yeah. Um, so waist for waist for male, hip measurement for a woman. If you teach them how to be pretty accurate with it as an adjunct for fat loss, um, but yeah, that's just because you the, the signal to noise ratio is so much higher with with fat loss. You can you can lose so much more of it, so you're much more likely to pick it up in a discrete measurement and it won't be drowned out by, you know, other things that are changing, like with a, uh, uh, a caliper trying to, me- or rather a girth measurement trying to measure, measure, measure muscle changes. Right. And some things that, um, could sound conflicting, right. But are actually aren't like Brad saying he has this girl and she in 10 weeks, psh, big transformation. Right. And then you're saying, these dude, like you're, you're un, oh, you're not appreciating how slow it takes to gain this shit. But that girl is never gonna have another ten week period like that if she mm-hmm. keeps lifting, you know. And that's where the psychological, um, like you said, Brad, the mind fuck comes in. Is like she's like, oh my god, mm-hmm. I'm so happy. Da, da, da. Well, she'll, if if that is, not that it's bad for her to be happy about it, right? But if that's like the only thing in life that makes her not happy, she will never feel like that again after every subsequent training block. Because it does mm-hmm. get slower and slower over time, and it's um, a lot of times That's I feel like. I'm, oh, no, I was, was going to go off on a tangent, but you go. Okay, I was going to say a lot of times people feel like they're they're not making progress or they're um, plateauing or whatever, when all they're actually doing is just becoming a better lifter. Um, but okay, that was all I was going to say. Go ahead, Eric. I was going to say it's my same beef I have with uh, named programs because 
if you coming from a, a not so optimal training background or you switch from strength to hypertrophy or vice versa, like Brad described, mm -hmm. that first time it's, it's going to be a massive increase. And then you're going to ascribe that to that named program. Like, oh, I went on 531. I was always doing like 15s and, and hypertrophy work beforehand. And I got so strong. And then I tried Westside. Didn't work too well. I tried Shaco. Didn't work too well. It's because you're always expecting to have that same massive increase in yeah. strength that you got that first time. And really, that just had everything to do with where you were in your training and what you were previously adapted to rather than that program itself. Yeah, same uh, and with I diets. Think, yeah, and you see, you see people just fall in love with with uh, a specific uh, name for a, an approach because it just happened to occur at a time when uh, they had their noob gains. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think you you especially see people bounce bounce between high and low volume programs because one kind of sets you up for the other, and they get confused and like you know if they go from you know hit to to Shiko, it's going to be, whoa, you know, and vice versa and until they plateau. It's like, you know, they, they're getting a deload and, and, and a temporary <laughs> increase and then they plateau and they can't figure out why. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's one of those things where it's important to understand the, the mechanisms behind your training rather than just seeing it as a, a named object. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, and how many times do we hear, you know, the, the, the flip side of that is I, I tried, you know, German volume training or whatever program for – for 8, 10, 12 weeks, and then when I switched to this program, it worked so much better, so therefore, you know, said program beforehand, German volume training or whatever, sucked. You know, mm -hmm. you don't want to do that one. You know, it, it, named programs do that, you know, because one way works, one way doesn't, but it wasn't the program, you know, it was, that's, what, that's why we are what we do. We, we teach the principles of training, and we teach all of those, those important things to understand so that you can understand, well, it wasn't that that program sucked, you know, it was that this program would differ from this program because of these variables and in my training and then as my life as a lifter and whether I was quote unquote bulking or cutting, you know, et cetera. Um, yeah, I mean, sometimes, sometimes named programs that are actually pretty good get a bad rap, um, you know, just for that reason. Right. You heard, you heard it here. Brad Lemus endorses German volume training. <laughs> 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 oh my god. Ten, uh, ten by ten, once once per week, nothing else. <laughs> um so if I'm an off season physique athlete or someone who just wants to get bigger over time, um just to summarize some things that I could do to to make sure I'm making progress with that goal if I'm provided I'm doing a sound program and blah blah blah. Um pictures over not too often of time, right? First okay. off, I would say is if Cut. you're early enough in your training program and you're just your training is still visibly increasing in some kind of oh, measurable format, then don't even just just keep doing that. You know? Yeah. Um, then once you get to a more advanced stage where it takes longer, then you can start looking at pictures every whatever you're going to say. Great. Well, that's a great point. And then you had said every three months or so. I like them every, if I have an off-season Skype client, I get them every time. So it's like, for me, it's eight to 12 weeks. Um, Perfect. Sometimes they don't look different. Sometimes they do. Um, Oops, my battery's ready to die. Hey, one thing, Andrea, I yeah. wanted to just kind of touch on is, you know, since we're talking about tracking progress, you know, I, I, I think it's important at least to, to at least really briefly just touch on our other, you know, measurable ways of progression, you know, okay. not just numbers, not just aesthetics, not just the gains, but we, we kind of touched on it, but I mean, we, we I kind of want to talk about skill, you know, too. Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, let's just look at you. Cause I, I don't know. I just, I, I'm such a sports fan and I'm such a, a, a fan of athletes. You know, you look at yourself, you know, um, you know, having, you know, done what now a year and a half, uh, of grid and, and all the different disciplines mm -hmm. that you have to do. Um, look at the skill that you've acquired, you know, over this period of time. Um, and mm -hmm. I, th I don't want to really delve into it, but I, I really want to at least touch on, um, you know, pr tracking progress in that manner as well. Yeah, that's a really great point. Go ahead, Eric. It is a really great point because I was talking about earlier for – the relationship between hypertrophy and strength, how it is a more valid 
uh, predictor if everything else is constant. Mm -hmm. But if you are someone who is just doesn't really pay attention to, to, to skill because you know, I'm a bodybuilder, I only care about you know, stressing the muscle, not moving from point A to point B, and your RDL looks freaking terrible. And <laughs> Full if body your RDL rows. forms, yeah, if your RDL <laughs> is now improving, or That's if your it. row is becoming, is going from Pendele to Yates, you know, <laughs> that is completely invalid. So yeah. becoming a skilled lifter is very important, not just for, you know, injury prevention and targeting the, the, the muscles you actually think you're targeting, um, but also because then when you test it under the same conditions, it's more likely to be a true change. So I totally agree with Brad yeah. for, yeah, but and, and even more important, I would say that more important than, than measuring uh, good changes, that's just more relevant to our discussion, is that decrease in injury risk uh, and that insurance that the volume you're doing with that lift is actually targeting the muscle you think it is, which is something you brought up in a either a blog post that hasn't gone out yet or that already I did. did, Andrea. Yeah, it just came out. Is it out yet? Yeah. It just it, came out, yeah. Sunday. Was that you, you may think your, your back is weak because hashtag genetics or hashtag clavicle width, but it might actually be because your rows are primarily hitting your lower back and your biceps or yeah. you're, you're rounded. You're, you're just Those T-Rex pull-ups. Yeah. And then, <laughs> okay, so this, is the solution doing more volume with a shitty movement pattern? Most certainly not. That's probably going to exacerbate the uh, that imbalance and then lead to injury. So I think, uh, yeah, we definitely can't neglect that if you are a coach, you should be looking at your lifts of yeah. your athletes and, and, and trying to improve the, the quality of uh, performance yeah. over time as well. <laughs> Do you have the people that can't decide if they want to like deadlift sumo or conventional and then you find out later that they've been doing both and you're like, oh my God, has this ever happened to y'all? Because it's happened to me recently. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but um, they're like, well, it's sometimes this, sometimes that, but on, on certain days I use sumo and certain I conventional. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe. I wouldn't even <laughs> think to ask that. Like, I'm not trying to be <laughs> shitty, but I just really... Because it says sumo or conventional was the option I gave them, and they just like juggled them. I was like, "Oh Jesus!" Um, I, I've had similar miscommunications like that. Like I'll have <laughs> uh, I'll put horizontal row of choice, for mm -hmm. example, meaning that in my mind, when you start the program for the and next eight the weeks, you're going to choose a horizontal row and go with it. And then, then I look at the weights, and I'm like, "They went from 225 to 60," <laughs> and then I realized they went from barbell rows to a dumbbell. Anyway, dumbbell, row. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's a yeah. row of choice. And I'm like, well, why did you even drop your reps? Like you went from three sets of eight to three sets of seven. Like that was some kind of progress. How do you go from 225 to 60 and figure that's a, so yeah, yeah I think um, yeah, the communication. Probably, probably even, even more relevant than that is like uh, when we're talking about the, the skill, you know, you look at my, my, my lap pull downs and my rows from, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, the weight was damn near like 50 to a hundred pounds more. Um, than what I do now. Yet, why is my back looking and my lats really looking so much better now using less weight uh, as I did 12 or 15 years ago? Well, again, I was doing the, the, the proverbial, you know, chest row, you know, like this. <laughs> and it. my body moving and my shoulders not moving, you know. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, there's, there's again that, that skill. I'm using less weight, arguably a lot less more volume, but I'm actually using my lats. I'm actually moving the weight uh, with my lats and not dry humping the handle. You know. <laughs> oh. So you mean, you mean like that that Instagram video where you put up when you said, "Hey, I got uh, was it 300 for five? And I was like, "I only see three reps." And you're like, "I don't get it." I, <laughs> I was like, uh, "Brad, your butt came up, so therefore it's not a bench press because it didn't adhere to the movement oh standards of a bench press." <laughs> Y'all, I'm so happy someone said dry humping on our podcast. It just makes me happy. <laughs> oh, my God. Um, that's uh, something else, too, that I was, because I trained at a CrossFit gym, had this conversation the other day. Um, don't laugh. Don't laugh at that. I was, he loves I was the CrossFitters. Laughing. He's laughing at dry humping? What are you laughing at? Yes. Okay. Whatever makes me not have CrossFitters angry at me. Is what I was... <laughs> The you do a powerlifting bench versus like how um, the 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 old argument of like that's not you know but your chest is closer and it's not using and you're you're just using your shoulders and it's just like all this other shit um, because what's funny is they'll they'll do because there's there's ring muscle ups and like all, all there's a lot of ring work so the the often measured uh, bench press is a close grip bench or like the the neutral grip. What are they called, bars? You know, the ones that's like these way. 
Cambridge yeah. Park. Whatever the hell they are. Nah, it's like a rectangle, and it has like oh, with the ones ribs with the in it. On the inside. <laughs> yeah. Um, I always call it a squish bar, but oh, what okay. talking about. Um, just the, the idea, and you did a video or, or two on this, Eric, where it's like, well, but your um, the load you're using is so much heavier that whether you're using less chest predominantly overall, it's still, um, it's still more volume because it is a heavier barbell kind of thing. It's just, um, arguments it's like that. Half dozen together, yeah. You know? It's my, arguments my like be, that. Go ahead. You can maybe make that argument when you're talking with extreme examples. You know, you can, you can break the logical rules if you're talking about a shirted bench press technique but really I mean a raw bench press te technique unless someone is hyper flexible and we're talking you know the Japanese lifters or some of the gals who their butt is you know three inches away from their yeah scapula. exactly their, their, <laughs> their scapula yeah no you don't want to do that but you couldn't even if you if you, if you wanted to but the average person who is tucking their feet back creating a, a wider slightly grip. exaggerated lordotic spine uh, you know and then wider grip and then touching the peak of their arch and then driving back uh, upon initiation of the bench press, eh, it's more of a decline. They're protecting their shoulder, and it is the most effective way to get the weight from point A to point B. And if a CrossFit competition included the bench press, guess how they'd be doing it? Just <laughs> yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, another one, too, with, with the form dependence or whatever is squats, right? They're all training for Olympic lifting eventually. So they'll have the high bar, very upright squats, and they'll see mine or Brandon's. Or I think Ryan Doris came to our CrossFit gym when he was visiting here, and they were all like, What's, what the fuck is this? You know, because they think it's a good morning. But <laughs> it's like, um, the, just being dogmatic about the form, like that there's, like like you said, Brad, there's, there's changing your form in order to work the muscles that you want to work because we need to look this way and develop these things versus this weight has to move, and that doesn't mean that it's wrong, but I guess if you're talking about a powerlifter or a bodybuilder, the correct form, um, in quote, in air quotes, the most effective form might look very different, right? Yeah, I and mean, it's going to be different for individuals, too. I mean, uh, it doesn't matter if you put some lifters in a high bar squat position, it'll still yeah. look kind of good morning, just because the relationship between their torso length yeah. and their femur length, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, yeah, the the idea that there is a certain way all lifts should look for everyone is just a denial of biomechanics and individual yeah. differences. But um, yeah, I think more relevant to the discussion we're having is that you want to test with the same form that you train, uh, and in the case of powerlifter, in the same form that you compete. Um, not to say that you have to do ten paused reps on bench press when you're you know twenty four weeks out. But, um, you know, it needs, it needs to have some kind of relevance to, to what you're testing for. Yeah. And so the load could go down, but the form could be more effective. Yes. And that's what is more important. Yeah. And, and that will theoretically a, even increase the ceiling on, on your strength long term, you know. Um, or in a, for a bodybuilder, that will increase the ability to actually put load where you want it. Right. All right. So anything else that we missed? Anything to go backwards on, Brad? Before we we sum up, what were we on? Um, oh, other ways to measure physique besides visual. Yeah, was, and and, and I, I almost hate to mention this because we're almost going to open up a whole other can of worms here. But um, I think we can break it down into a very pragmatic, you know, approach. Is that you know, Andrew, you talked about you know the the bench press, you know, arch and and how you're cutting down on your range of motion and. You're now practicing the bench press, you know, in a powerlifting style. Well, now you're cutting volume because you're not getting the same range of motion as you were before when you were flat back. You know what I mean? And, and when you're kind of talking about, you know, those those kinds of changes, you know, it, it again, it all comes down to consistency over time. If you if you go with that that bench press, um, you know, arch, or even if you go from the arch to the flat back, you know, there's that initial change, you know. But then it's all a matter of what happens after that and what you're comparing to after that right so mm -hmm. if you make that change now we're measuring progress based on on, on that change right there and we're always mm -hmm. going to be you know training using the principles we do to, to progress in that particular way that we're now doing that or if it's that you're now doing deeper with your squat or you're going from you know high bar or low bar or, or, or something like that 
Um, something you guys mentioned too is that you know sometimes the lifters, you know, they'll 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 do you know sumo and conventional. You know, I'm I have a big problem with that if you're you're training sumo and then you test conventional or in the middle of the block you're mm-hmm. shifting from conventional to sumo. However, I, I'm I'm less uh, appalled by that. I guess you might say if we're tracking progress and we're doing this particular system on the sumo and then we've got a separate way of tracking and yeah. a separate with system on the conventional, you know? Right. Um, so like, again, I, I don't want to open up a whole nother can of worms because I mean, shit, we can make a whole nother hour and a half podcast on this, but it's open. It's uh, open. And I have something to say. Uh-oh. <laughs> what you did, Brad? Is your phone going to die? It. Shoot. No, I got it plugged in. We're okay. good. Yeah, okay. I got plugged it in. We're good. So, But it's, a, it's actually a really important point Brad makes is that um, I think people get into psychological trouble when they compare their performance to something that is not relevant to their current performance. And yes. I mean that not just in the way of comparing a sumo to a conventional, but let's say you just did a contest prep. And you're really stressed out because you think you're losing muscle because you're now 180 pounds instead of 210 pounds and your bench press is only – it is down 20 pounds. It's like that's – that you can't compare that. That's an increased range of motion. You're in a dieted state. You're psychologically stressed. You're doing five days of cardio. The only time that actually is, is relevant is last contest prep when you were near 180 pounds. What mm-hmm. were you lifting? You know? Um, a great one that I've had to really teach myself is post injury. You know, mm-hmm. like when I start squatting again for the first time in a month, I'm not going to sit there and be like, "Well, my, I'm in a program based off of a 495 max back squat." Yeah. It's like, what do you out of your mind? You haven't squatted in, in, in four months. You know, so yeah. um, that you, you just can't do that. Or, or coming off of a layoff or vacation or um, weight loss. Like like I said, in all those situations, you you have to gauge progress relative to where you currently are. You kind of have to have a little bit of amnesia relative to where you were if some kind of curveball that you wish hadn't happened got thrown at you Yeah. because you're not serving yourself, um, comparing yourself to your best at all times. That's only going to create a situation where you're attempting which you shouldn't be and you're never pleased with your progress and that is actually going to short circuit your ability to progress from where you are, which is actually how you end up beating your previous PRs. Yeah, that's funny. Um, I just had an athlete who came back from like a week and a half long trip out of the country. And one week later, he was like, everything's shit. And I'm like, just, you have a vacation hangover. It's going to be fine. It's going to be fine. It's just, you know, the, the stress when you come back. And and what's funny is he had a couple aches and pains. And he was like, I thought the week off would really help him. And it's, um, if that's one thing that I've learned, and, and speaking of injuries, is that inactivity is, we've talked about this before, is not always the answer and can often make it worse. Um, worse than low-level, low-load activities with purpose kind of thing. So that that's a really good point that although we talked about traveling while dieting and it's not going to kill everything, it will make things different for a little bit. Doesn't mean it killed everything, but um, it also depends on training age too. I've noticed yeah. um beginners pushing hard take a week off and they come back and they feel like supermen. Um <laughs> yeah. but if I take a week off from my regular scheduled powerlifting training, I just like right. So the next week I'm gonna be about five percent weaker. That's the way it goes, mm-hmm. you know? Because they I don't know whether that's your top end skill and neuromuscular adaptations that drop off quick and then come back quick. But yeah, yeah I've noticed experienced lifters typically don't do well after a short amount of time, time completely off. Yeah. Short being a couple of weeks or even a month, but, um, it's different when you're still making your newbie gains. Yeah. Um, newbie gains is a special time prep, special time or just dieting, right? If your body composition is just very different than it used to be. Mm-hmm. adjusting for that and then and then another thing is tracking progress based on uh, again because i work out at a crossfit gym seeing um or like when you're in in football uh locker rooms right the, the 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 prs are on the board and i'm like yeah but i weigh like 30 pounds more than that girl you know what i mean mm-hmm. so it's like not that exciting or or vice versa right i'll look at girls who have been training for 40 years or um who exclusively train powerlifting and i'm like i'm a bitch you know, but I look at girls my size that are off-season figure girls, and I'm like, damn, I'm kind of strong. So it, it's all relative, in, like you said, the comparison and tracking to different part you at different times, um, different people, even at the same body weight. Because um, how many sports perform a back squat as part of their strength and conditioning, whereas a power lifter should still have pound for pound a better back squat than a football player or, well, some of them, anyways. 
Um, yeah. <laughs> it depends at, at the same body weight, but it that, that's just a really good watch. point. It's kind of fun to watch during the NFL Combine when they had to bench press 225 pounds for reps uh -huh. as part of the NFL Combine. You know, you, all, all the athletes you know, mm -hmm. had to do that. So then naturally on the IGs, you know, and the FBs and all that, all the people are doing the 225-pound bench. How many reps can I do the the, the 225-pound bench press, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, you just got a kick out of all the different responses. You know, power lifters are like, oh, I can smoke that. You know, I can bench press 500 pounds. I'll and get I'm like, can you repetition. run a 50? Can you, can you just run down the field? <laughs> all you power lifters, exactly. can you run down the field and, without getting hurt? <laughs> exactly. And yeah. they were so disappointed when they got 225 <laughs> for like 15, you know? And yeah. the announcer on the freaking NFL network got it for like 39, you know? <laughs> You know, it's it's all that skill. It's all that skill and, and what it is yeah. that, that you are are training for. I I often wonder why they should even be doing the bench press in the NFL they combine because they, they, they certainly know. are not <laughs> bench pressing on the yeah. field, you know. <laughs> all right. I'm gonna lay on my back. You lay evenly across my hands, straighten your body, and then I will block you that way. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, especially considering the amount you can push is totally dependent on your body weight that you can actually stabilize. Like there was a study back in the day on how much someone could effectively do a cable chest press with, and it's 40% of their body mass. Or they start pushing themselves away, and they, they can't stabilize it. It doesn't matter how freaking strong you are. You can't do more than 40% of your body weight. It's just physics. So, yeah, you can have a fat lineman who, you know, benches less than a – a guy who weighs half his size who's a free safety, and it just doesn't matter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other, any other Speci worms? Specificity, I think, Spec is what we're getting at. Specificity. Spec no more cans, no more worms. Okay. I think, I think I'm good, but I, we didn't finish. <laughs> other ways to measure physique progress. We keep going back to, to skill and, and strength and all that. Um, I, I, okay, I'm going to throw it out there. My, my clothes are a big indicator for me, personally. Where, where they're tighter, where like if uh, dudes are like, oh shit, my shirt's getting tighter, that's great. But like my pants, not so great. Um, I just think people underestimate that. What? If the waistband but, is, not, is getting tighter, what about, but what you're. About your quads and your glutes getting bigger. Well, boys don't wear tight stuff on their quads. Well, never mind. Nowadays, okay. All right. You're right. Hey, Depending on where you live and how old you are. I know. Okay. <laughs> um, no one's listening to MC Hammer anymore, okay? <laughs> <laughs> or where your shirt's getting tighter, right? The bottom of it, you hope, isn't really, but the top of it, you hope, is. Um, but I'm just saying that's that's a good indicator for me. Right? If I wake up, at this point, though, tell me if you guys are the same in this. When I wake up, I can tell if I'm heavier or or getting a little leaner. Can y'all tell this? Like, just by feeling know, your own body? Myself. No, I don't weigh myself. I'm saying, like, I can Visually. look in the mirror. No, like, feel my stomach, and I'm like, okay, you ate a lot last night. Or, like, um... Or if it's like three or four mornings in a row of like two a days, I can feel it in my physique. Oh, I, okay. So you're okay. I, I misinterpreted what you're saying. So I thought you were looking at yourself saying I'm going to weigh more today or I'm going to weigh less. But you're saying I can I'm look at myself and say I'm tightening different. up or I'm yeah stressed out and or eating too much. The problem is though that I think too many neurotic people will be able to assess that accurately for the day and assume it means something long term when it mm. really just means you had Indian food last night. <laughs> you're right. It feels different. It may not mean that, yeah. that you are in a deficit for the week or, or a surplus, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, I, yeah, I'd like not to throw my wife under the bus, but we'll have like mac and cheese and Indian two days in a row and she'll be like, I think I'm really gaining a lot of weight. And I was like, it depends on what you do the rest of the days, but I think you might have just had Indian and mac and cheese, like a bunch of carbs <laughs> and sodium right before you went to bed. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's yeah. um. I think that's a skill too, but it's really if, easy. If, or I don't say easy. It took me a long time, but I'm pretty to, accurate at this point. If you use that to think about what your food choice should be the rest of the week, like. You know, three days this week I woke up feeling really bloated and like I ate a lot and I'm still eating at the same time. Maybe I should be a little lighter for my dinners for the rest of the week. That's fine. But if you wake up and you're like, oh my God, I've lost all my progress, then, then yeah. that's a different. Which is how I used to read it. I need to go lift all the stuff. Right now. Yeah. Right. Or like, oh God, my favorite uh, because 
because Facebook and girls, my favorite is like, I have to go do cardio right now because of mm -hmm. what I just ate. And I'm like, what? <laughs> because. Or, or, or even worse yet. Oh, look there. I had a high day and I dropped four pounds. I better make the next one higher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm, for real, y'all should never go into Pinterest. You'd shoot yourself. If y'all ever been to Pinterest. Oh, it's bad. It's bad. Yeah, they don't they don't have an evidence based exercise community on Pinterest. Did you know that there's things you can do on Pinterest that will grow your ass but not your thighs? Or things that can make your hips wider? So you can look like a Kardashian? Did you know that you can do that? I think and, we're getting on top. I know, but and you can get rid of your teacher <laughs> arms. You can get rid of teacher arms with five exercises a day for ten you minutes. Hate, you hate Jane's? <laughs> yeah. Or your your lunch lady wings. You know, okay. this, is, this is stuff. This is the stuff that I overhear at the hospital all the time. <laughs> okay, um, so close. Y'all do or don't agree? I'm just saying. For me, I can I can pretty much at this point feel like all right. Over these last couple weeks, when I wake up, I'm noticing this trend. Maybe I should tighten up a little bit. Or um, when I'm injured, I, and, and I'm eat the same things because I'm a fucking robot. Just because that's how I live. And I'm like, oh, things are getting a little squishier. Okay, let's not. You know. Um, and then close also, but okay. Y'all are done talking. So I, any... I don't know if I agree that the close are a good indicator. Really? Time. It would have to be over a significant it... amount of time. Well, yeah. With the same clothes and making sure you haven't washed it so that it got tighter. Oh my god. Okay. Never mind. Don't listen. Same brand. <laughs> well, same I wear the five. exact same Nike shorts like every fucking day. So okay. Um you don't and have like jeans that are getting tighter stretch on your material. quads. If your jeans are getting tighter on your quads and you're not getting right. fat and you're not getting tighter on your waist, like I'm just saying these are things you can use. I would agree. To dissociate However, from the scale so much if it's a yes. problem. Sure. I agree with that. Okay. That was context. Um, do I have to agree with you now? No, but podcasts? you don't have to like <laughs> disagree with me. That's bad. I think it's very useful for some people. I, yeah, I, th I think there are some, situations where, okay. where, where clothes could, could be used. Usually, I don't know if I I'm use generalizing, them. usually off-season females. Just saying. Maybe. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. For some of my ladies. All right. Um, I think we did good. I think so, too. That was fun. I really enjoyed that. Okay, great. I'll talk to you all soon. I enjoy it when I get oh. to learn, too. I know. Okay. Just use clothes to measure your progress from now on, no, bro. And drink Everclear. And what was the other thing? Have fun. Everclear. Drink Everclear and have fun. And, yeah. and don't wash your clothes. Okay, see ya. Bye.